though I'm going to be reading some passages out of Pratchett's books, what I'm really looking at is the character of Igor. He's quite fascinating in a gruesome kind of way. The first clip comes from Thief of Time. There was a knocking at the door. Jeremy wondered if the dream would end when the door was opened, and then the door disappeared, and the knocking went on. It was coming from downstairs. The time was 6.47. Jeremy glanced at the alarm clocks to make sure that they were right, and then pulled his dressing gown around him and hurried downstairs. He opened the front door a crack. There was no one there. Nah, down here, mister. Someone lower down was a dwarf. Name a Clarkson? It said, yes. The clipboard was thrust through the gap. Sign here, where it says, sign here. Thank you. Okay, lads. Behind him, a couple of trolls tipped a handcart. A large wooden crate crashed onto the cobbles. What is this? Jeremy asked. Express packet, said the dwarf, taking the clipboard. Came all the way from Uberwald. Must have cost someone a load. Look at all them seals and stickers and such on it. Can't you bring it in? Jeremy began, but the cart was already moving off with the merry jingle and tinkle of fragile items. It started to rain. Jeremy peered at the label on the crate. It was certainly addressed to him in neat round hand, and just above it was the double-headed bat, the seal of Uberwald. There was no other marking anywhere except near the bottom where it said, Upside this. Then the crate started to swear. It was muffled and in a foreign language, but all swearing has a certain international content. Um, hello, said Jeremy. The crate rocked and landed on one of the long sides, and then with extra cursing. There was some thumping from inside and some louder swearing, and the cart teetered upright again with the alleged top being the right way up. A piece of board slid aside, and a crowbar dropped out and clanged onto the street. The voice that had lately been swearing said, If you would be so good. Jeremy inserted the bar into a likely-looking crack and pulled. The crate sprang apart. He dropped the bar. There was a creature inside. Oh, I don't know, it said, pulling bits of packing material off of itself. Eight bloody days with no problems, and then those idiots get it wrong on the doorstep. It nodded at Jeremy. Jeremy. Good morning, sir. I suppose you are Master Jeremy? Yes, but my name is Igor, sir. My credentials, sir? A hand, like an industrial accent held together with stitches, thrust a sheaf of papers towards Jeremy. He recoiled instinctively, and then felt embarrassed and took them. I think there's been a mistake, he said. No, no mistake, said Igor, pulling a carpet bag out of the ruins of the crate. You need an assistant, and when it comes to assistance, you cannot go wrong with an Igor. Everyone knows that. Could we go inside out of the rain, sir? It's making my knees rust. But I don't need an assistant, Jeremy began. But that was wrong, wasn't it? He just couldn't keep assistance. They always left within a week. Morning, sir, said a cheery voice. Another cart had pulled up. This one was painted a gleaming, hygienic white and was full of milk churns and had our soak dairyman painted on the side. Distracted, Jeremy looked up at the beaming face of Mr. Soak, who was holding a bottle of milk in each hand. One pint, squire, as per usual, and perhaps another one if you've got company. Uh, 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 yes, thank you. And the yogurt today is particularly fine, squire, said Mr. Soak encouragingly. Uh, I think not, Mr. Soak. Need any eggs, cream, butter, buttermilk, or cheese? Not as such, Mr. Soak. Right you are, then, said Mr. Soak, unabashed. See you tomorrow, then. Uh, yes, said Jeremy, as the cart moved on. Mr. Soak was a friend, which in Jeremy's limited vo social vocabulary meant someone I speak to once or twice a week. He approved of the milkman because he was regular and punctual and had the bottles on the doorstep every morning at the stroke of 7 a.m. Um, goodbye, he said. He turned to Igor. How did you know I needed... He tried, but... 
The strange man had gone indoors, and a frantic Jeremy tracked him down in the workshop. "'Oh, yes, very nice,' said Igor, who was taking it all in with the air of a connoisseur. "'That's a Turnbull Mark III microlith, isn't it?' "'I saw it in their catalogue. Very nice, indeed.' "'I didn't ask anyone for an assistant,' Jeremy said. "'Who sent you?' "'We are Igor, sir.' "'Yes, you said. Look, I don't—' "'No, sir. We are Igor, sir. The organization, sir.' "'What organization?' "'For placements, sir. You see, sir, with one thing and another, an Igor often finds himself between masters through no fault of his own, sir. You see, and on the other hand—' "'You have two thumbs,' breathed Jeremy, who had just noticed and could not stop himself. Two on each hand. Oh, yes, sir. Very handy, said Igor, not even glancing down. On the other hand, there is no shortage of people wanting an Igor. So my Aunt Igorina runs our select little agency. For, for lots of Igors? said Jeremy. Oh, there's a fair number of us. What a big family. Igor handed Jeremy a card. It read, We are Igors, a spare hand when needed. The old Rathus, bad Shushane, Seamail, Yes Master, Uberwald. Jeremy stared at the semaphore address. His normal ignorance of anything that wasn't to do with clocks did not apply here. He had been quite interested in the new cross continent semaphore system after hearing that it made quite a lot of use of clockwork mechanisms to speed things up. So you could send a clax message to hire an Igor. Well, that explained the speed, at least. Rathus, he said, that means something like a council hall, doesn't it? Normally, sir, normally, said Igor reassuringly. Really have semaphore addresses in Uberwald? Oh, yes, we are ready to grasp the future with both hands, sir, and four thumbs. Yes, sir, we can grasp like anything. And then you mailed yourself here? Certainly, sir. We Igors are no strangers to discomfort. Jeremy looked down at the paperwork he'd been handed, and a name caught his eye. The top was singed. In a way, at least, there was a message in the neat capitals. He will be useful. Lady Lejean. He remembered. Oh, Lady Lejean is behind this? She had you sent her? Sent here? To me? That's correct, sir. Feeling that Igor was expecting more of him, Jeremy made a show of reading through the list of what turned out to be references. Some of them were written in what he could only hope was dried brown ink. One was in crayon, and several were singed around the edges. They were all fulsome, and after a while a certain tendency could be noted among the signatories. This one is signed by someone called Mad Doctor Scoop, he said. Oh, he wasn't actually named Mad, sir. It was more a nickname, as it were. Was he mad, then? Who can say, sir, said Igor calmly. And crazed Baron Haha, it says, under reason for leaving that he was crushed by a burning windmill. Case of mistaken identity, sir. Really? Yes, sir. I understand the mob mistook him for the screaming Dr. Berserk, sir. Ah, yes, said Jeremy, glancing down, who you also worked for, I see. Yes, sir. And who died of blood poisoning? Yes, sir, caused by a dirty pitchfork. And Nipsey the Impaler? Oh, uh, would you believe he ran a kebab shop, sir? Did he? Not conventionally so, sir. You mean he was mad, too? Ah, well, he did have his little ways. I must admit, but an Igor never passes judgment upon his master or his mistress, sir. It is the code of the Igors, sir, he added patiently. It would be a funny old world if we were all alike, sir. Jeremy was completely baffled as to his next move. He'd never been good at talking to people, and this, apart from Lady Lee Jean and a wrangle with Mr. Soak over an unwanted cheese, was the longest conversation he had had in a year. Perhaps it was because it was hard to think of Igor as coming under the heading of people. 
Up until now, Jeremy's definition of people had not included anyone with more stitches than a handbag. I'm not sure I've got any work for you, though, he said. I've got a new commission, but I'm not sure. Anyway, I'm not insane. That's not compulsory, sir. I've actually got a piece of paper that says I'm not, you know. Well done, sir. Not many people have one of those. Very true, sir. I take medicine, you know. Well done, sir, said Igor. I'll just go and make some breakfast, shall I, while you go get the rest, master. Jeremy clutched at his damp dressing gown. I will be down shortly, he said, and he hurried up the stairs. Igor's gaze took in the racks of tools. There was not a spot of dust upon them. The files, hammers, and pliers were all arranged according to size, and the items on the workbench were positioned with geometrical exactitude. He opened a drawer. Screws were laid out in perfect rows. He looked around the walls. They were bare, except for the shelves of clocks. This was surprising. Even the dribbling Dr. Vibes had a calendar on the wall, which added a splash of color. Admittedly, it was from the Acid Bath and Restraint Company in Ugali, and the color it splashed was mostly red, but at least it showed some recognition of a world outside the four walls. Iger was puzzled. He had never worked for a sane person before. He'd worked for a number of, well, the world called them madmen, and he'd worked for several normal people, in that they only indulged in minor and socially acceptable insanities, but he couldn't ever recall working for a completely sane person. Obviously, he reasoned, if sticking screws up your nose was madness, then numbering them and keeping them in careful compartments was sanity, which was the opposite of... Ah, no. No, it wasn't. Igor smiled. He was beginning to feel quite at home already. Eight pages later, we pick up the story again. Um, have you ever read a Spratchett book that doesn't have half a dozen different plot lines crashing into each other? It's amazing. Jeremy stared at his bed sheets. They were covered in writing, his own handwriting. It trailed across the pillow and onto the wall, and there were sketches, too, scored deeply into the plaster. He found his pencil under the bed. He'd even sharpened it in his sleep. In his sleep, he'd sharpened a pencil. And, by the look of it, he'd been writing and drawing for hours, trying to draw a dream, with, down one side of the eider down, a list of parts. It had all made absolute sense when he'd seen it, like a hammer or a stick or, wheel by, or Wheelbright's gravity escarpment. It had been like meeting an old friend, and now, he stared at the scrawled lines, he'd been writing so fast he ignored, ignored punctuation and some of the letters, too. But he could see the sense of it. He'd heard of this sort of thing. Great inventions sometimes did arise from dreams or daydreams. Didn't Hatsabaya Whitlow have the idea for the adjustable pendulum as a result of his work as a public hangman? Didn't Wilframe Balderton always say that the idea for the fishtail escarpment came after he'd eaten too much lobster? Yes, it had been so clear in the dream, but by daylight it needed a bit more work. There was a clatter of dishes in the little kitchen behind his workshop. He hurried down, dragging the sheet behind him. I usually have toast, sir, said Igor, turning away from the range. Lightly browned, I suspect. How did you know that? When Igor learns to anticipate, sir, said Igor. What a wonderful little kitchen, sir. I've never seen a drawer marked spoons, which just contained spoons. Are you any good at working with glass, Igor? said Jeremy, ignoring us. No, sir said Igor, buttering the toast. You're not? No, sir, I am bloody amazing at it, sir. Many of my masters had need of special apparatuses that were not readily attainable elsewhere, though. What is it you wanted? How would you go about building this? Jeremy spread the sheet on the table. The slice of toast dropped from Igor's black-nailed fingers. Is something wrong? Jeremy said. I thought someone was walking over my grave, though, said Igor, still looking shocked. Um, you haven't actually ever had a grave, 
Have you? asked Jeremy. Just a figure of speech, sir, just a figure of speech, said Igor, looking slightly hurt. This is an idea I've had. I've had for a clock. The glass clock, sir, said Igor. Yes, I know about it. My grandfather, Igor, helped build the first one. The first one? But it's just a story for children. And I dreamed about it, and... Grandfather Igor always said there was something very strange about all that, said Igor. The explosion and everything. It exploded because of the metal spring? Not exactly an explosion, said Igor. We're no strangers to explosions, us Igors. It was very odd, and we're no strangers to odd, either. Are you telling me it really existed? Igor seemed embarrassed about this. Yes, he said, and then again, no. Things either exist or they don't, said Jeremy. I'm very clear about that. I have medicine. It existed, said Igor, and then, after it did, it never had. This is what my grandfather told me, and he built that clock with these very hands. Jeremy looked down. Igor's hands were gnarled, and now that he came to look at them, had a lot of scar tissue around the wrists. We really believe in heirlooms in our family, said Igor, catching his gaze. Sort of hand-me-downs, <laughs> said Jeremy. He wondered if his medicine was due. Very droll, sir, said Igor. But Grandfather Igor always said that afterwards it was like a dream, sir. A dream? The workshop was different. The clock wasn't there. The demented Dr. Wangel, that was his master at the time, wasn't working on a glass clock at all, but on a way of extracting sunshine from oranges. Things were different, and they had always been, sir, like it had never happened. But it turned up in a book for children. Yes, sir. Bit of a conundrum there, sir. Jeremy stared down at the sheets with its burden of scribbles. An accurate clock. That's all it was. A clock that made all other clocks unnecessary. Lady Legene had said, building a clock like that would mean that the clockmaster went down in timekeeping history. True, the book said that time had gotten trapped in a clock, but Jeremy had no interest at all in things that were made up. Anyway, a clock measured. Distance did not get tangled up in a tape measure. All a clock did was count teeth on a wheel. Or light. Light with teeth. He'd seen it in the dream. Light, not as something bright in the sky, but as an excited line going up and down like a wave. Could you build something like this, he said. Igor looked at the drawings. Yes, he said, nodding. Then he pointed at several large glass containers around the drawing of the central column of the clock. Well, I know what these are, though, he said. In my dream, I mean, I imagine them as fizzing, said Jeremy. Very, very secret knowledge, that. Those jaws, said Igor, can you get me copper rods here, sir? And Hank, more pork? Easily. And zinc? Lots of it, yes. Sulfuric acid? By the carboy, yes. I must have died and gone to heaven. Just put me near enough copper and zinc and acid, sir, said Igor, and then we shall see sparks. Sam Vimes was nearly finished writing the letter when there was a knock at his door. Nearly done, he shouted. It's me, sir, said Constable Igor, pushing his head around the door, and then added, Igor, sir. Yes, Igor? said Vimes, who was wondering, and not for the first time, why anyone with stitches all the way around their head needed to tell anyone who he was. Asterisk down to the bottom. The Igor employed by the watch as a forensic specialist and medical aid was quite young, in so far as you could tell with an Igor, since useful limbs and organs were passed among Igors, as one might hand down a pocket watch. He was very modern in his thinking, he had a D.A. haircut with an extended quaff and wore crepe soles. Sometimes he forgot to lisp. Back to the story. I would just like to say, sir, that I could have gotten young strong in the arm back on his feet, sir, said Igor, a shade reproachfully. Vimes sighed. Igor's face was full of concern and tingled with disappointment. 
he had been prevented from plying his craft. He was naturally disappointed. We've been through this before, Igor. It's not like sewing a leg back on, and dwarfs are dead set against that sort of thing. There's nothing supernatural about it, though. I am a man of natural philosophy, and he was still warm when they brought him in. Those are the rules, Igor. Thanks all the same. We know your heart is in the right place. They are in the right places, sir, said Igor, reproachfully. That's what I meant, Vim said, without missing a beat, just as Igor never did. Oh, very well, sir, said Igor, giving up. He paused and then said, How is her ladyship, sir? Vimes had been expecting this. It was a terrible thing for a mind to do, but he had already presented himself with the idea of Igor and Sybil in the same sentence. Not that he disliked Igor, quite the reverse. There were watchmen walking all around the streets right now who wouldn't have legs if it wasn't for Igor's genius with a needle. But... Fine, she's fine, he said abruptly. Only I heard that Mrs. Content was a bit worried. Igor, there are some areas where... Look, do you know anything about women and babies? Not in so many words, sir. But I find that once I've got someone on the slab and had a good, you know, rummage around, I can sort out most things. Vimes' imagination actually shut down at this point. Thank you, Igor, he managed without his voice trembling, but Miss Content is very experienced as a midwife. Just as you say, sir, said Igor, but doubt rode on his every word. And now I've got to go. It's going to be a long day. <laughs> That's one of my favorite Igor scenes, and not for Igor, but for how people respond. You see, that's the genius of Pratchett. It's how people respond to each other. From making money. Here we go. You could always recognize an Igor. They went out of their way to be recognized. It wasn't just the musty, dusty old suits, or even the occasional odd digit or mismatched eyes. It was that they could probably stand a ball on the top of their head without it falling off. The Igor looked up. Good morning, Tho, and you all? Moist von Lipwig, said Moist, and you would be Igor. Caught it in one, Tho. I have heard many good things about you. Down here, I always keep an ear to the ground, Tho. Moist resisted the impulse to look down. Igor's and metaphors did not go well together. Well, Igor, the thing is, I want to bring someone into the building without the trouble of the guards. And I was wondering if there was another door down here. What he did not say, but what passed between them upon the ether was, You're an Igor, right? And when the mob is sharpening their sickles and trying to break down the door, the Igor is never there. Igors were the masters of the unobtrusive exit. Well, if a small door we use, so it can't be opened from the outside, so it never is caughted. My Moist looked longingly at the rainware on its stand. Fine, fine, fine. I'm just popping out, then. You're on the boss, sir? I shall be popping back shortly with a man, uh, a gentleman who is not anxious to meet civic authorities. Quite, sir. Give them a pitchfork, and they think they own the bloody place, sir. But he's not a murderer or anything. I'm an Igor, though. We don't ask questions. Really? Why not? I don't know, though. I didn't ask. Igor took Moist to a small door that opened into a grimy, trash-filled stairway, half flooded by the unremitting rain. Moist paused on the threshold, the water already soaking into the cheap suit. Just one thing, Igor. Yes, sir. How do I get back in? Just give the barber surgeon knock when you return, sir. What is the... The door closed. The Igor went back to his workbench and fired up the gas again. Some of the little glass tubes laying beside him on the piece of green felt looked 
odd and reflect to the light in disconcerting ways. The point about Igor's, the thing about Igor's, uh, well, most people never looked farther than the musty suit, the lank hair, the cosmetic clan scars, and the stitching and the lisp, and this was probably because, apart from the lisp, that was all there was to see. And people forgot, therefore, that most of the people who employed Igor's were not conventionally sane. A lot of them asked to build near storm tractors and set lightning storage jars, and they would laugh at you. Oh, they need, oh, how they needed someone to position in possession of a fully working brain, and every Igor was guaranteed to have at least one of those. Igors were, in fact, quite smart, which was why they were always elsewhere when the fiery torches hit the windmill. They were perfectionists. Ask them to build, build a device, and you wouldn't get what you asked for. You would get what you wanted. The sergeant did not answer. Instead, she opened a door off the main cell corridor and called out, Visitor for the patients, Igor. What with you, sergeant? The room within was brightly lit by an uncanny flickering blue light. Jars lined the shelves of one wall. Some had strange things moving in them. Very strange things indeed. Other things just floated. Blue sparks sizzled in some of the complex machinery, all copper balls and glass rods, in the corridor. But what mainly drew William's eye was the great big eye. Before he could actually scream, a hand reached up. What he thought was a huge eyeball was revealed as the largest magnifying glass he had ever seen. It swiveled up on a middle bracket attached to the forehead of its owner, but the face it revealed was barely an improvement. When it came to mouth desiccating horror, that was it. The eyes were on different levels. One ear was larger than the other. The face was a network of scars, but that was nothing compared to the deformed hairstyle. Igor's greasy black hair had been brushed forward into an overhanging quaff in the manner of the city's noisier young musicians, but to a length that could take out an eye in any innocent pedestrian. By the looks of the organic nature of Igor's work area, he could help put that back. There was a fish tank bubbling on one bench. Inside it, some potatoes were idly swimming backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Young Igor is part of our forensic department, said Sergeant Angua. Igor, this is Mr. DeWord. He wants to see the patients. William saw the quick glance Igor gave the sergeant, who added, Mr. Fimes says it is okay. Right this way, then, said Igor, lurching past William and into the corridor. Always nice to get visitors down here. You will find that we keep a very relaxed cell down here. I'll just go get the keys. Why does he only lisp the occasional S? said William, as Igor limped toward the cupboard. He's trying to be modern. You've never met an Igor before? Not one like that, no. He's got two thumbs on his right hand. He's from Uberwald, said the sergeant. Igors are very much into self-improvement. Fine surgeons, though. Just don't shake hands with one during a thunderstorm. Here we are, then said Igor, oh, lurching back. Who first? Lord Ventonari? asked William. He is still a fleet, though, said Igor. What, after all this time? Not surprising. It was a nasty blow he had. Sergeant Angua coughed loudly. I thought he fell off a horse, said William. Well, yes, and caught himself a blow when he hit his head on the floor of no doubt, said Igor glancing at Angua. He turned the key again. Lord Vecnari lay on a narrow bed. His face looked pale, but he seemed to be sleeping peacefully. He's not woken up at all, said William. No, I look in on him every fifteen minutes or so. It can be like that. Sometimes the body just says, sleep. I heard he hardly ever sleeps. Maybe he's taking this opportunity, said Igor, gently closing the door. He unlocked the next cell. Drumnot was sitting up in bed, his head bandaged. 
He was drinking some pale soup. He looked startled when he saw them and nearly spilled it. And how are we? Igor said, as cheerfully as a face full of stitches can allow. Um, I'm feeling much better. The young man looked from one face to another. Mr. The World here would like to talk to you. I will go and see if if Sergeant Anguia can help me sort out my eyeballs or something. William was left in an awkward silence. Drumnot was one of those people with no discernible character. You're Lord de World you're Lord de Word, son, aren't you? said Drumnot. You write that news sheet. Yes, said William. It seemed he would always be his father's son. Um they say Lord de Ventnari stabbed you. So they say, said the clerk. You were there, though. I knocked on the door to take him his copy of the paper, as he requested. His lordship opened it. I walked into the room, and the next thing I know, I was waking up with Mr. Igor looking at me. That must have come as a shock, said William, with a momentary flash of pride that the times had figured into this in any small way. They say I'd have lost the use of my arm if Igor hadn't been so good with a needle, said Drumnot earnestly. But your head's bandaged, too. I think I must have fallen over when... When whatever happened, said Drumnot. My gods, thought William. He's embarrassed. I have every confidence that there has been a mistake, Drumnot went on. His lordship has been preoccupied lately? His lordship is always preoccupied. It is his job said the clerk. Do you know that three people heard him say that he'd killed you? I cannot explain that. They must have been mistaken. The words were clipped and sharp. Any moment now, William thought. Why do you think... He began, and then was proven right. I don't think I have to talk to you, he said. Do I? No, but... Sergeant! Drumnot shouted. There were swift footsteps in the door, and the cell door opened. Yes, said Sergeant Agu. I have finished talking with this gentleman, and I am tired. William sighed and put his notebook away. Thank you. You've been very helpful. As he walked away in the corridor, he said, He doesn't want to believe his lordship might have attacked him. Really? said the sergeant. Looks like quite a bang he got on the head, William went on. Does it? Look, even I can see this smells funny. Can you? I see, said William. You went to the Mr. Vimes School of Communications, did you? Did I? said Sergeant Angua. Loyalty is a wonderful thing. Is it? This way out. After the sergeant had ushered William into the street, she went back upstairs into Vimes's office and quietly shut the door behind her. So he only spotted the gargoyles, said Vimes, who was watching William walk down the street. Apparently, but I wouldn't underestimate him so. He notices things. He was dead right about the peppermint bomb, and how many officers would have noticed how deeply that arrow went into the floor? That's unfortunately true. And he spotted Igor's second thumb, and hardly anyone notices that, and the swimming potatoes. Igor hasn't gotten rid of them yet. No, sir. He believes that instant fish and chips are only a generation away. Lime sighed. All right, Sergeant, forget about the potatoes. What are the odds? Sir? I know what goes on in the duty room. They wouldn't be watchmen if someone wasn't running a book. On Mr. DeWood, sir? Yes. Well, six will get you ten. He'll be dead by next Monday, sir. Mind you, just spread the word that I don't like that sort of thing, will you? Yes, sir. Find out who's running the book. And when you found out it is Nobby, take it off him. Right, sir. And Mr. DeWood? Fine stared at the ceiling. How many officers are watching him, he said. Three, sir. Nobby's usually good at juggling odds. I think that'll be enough? No, sir. Me neither. But we're stretched. He's going to have to learn the hard way. And the trouble about learning the hard way is you only get one lesson. All right. That's about enough. If you want to find out how Igor fits into these stories and <laughs> several others... Go look up Terry Pratchett's series on Discworld. You will not be upset. Or if you are, you deserve to be upset.